Hello, everyone. My name is Rich Ottinger, and I am the Marketing Programs Manager for Park Systems. Welcome to the fifth installment of Park Systems 2019 Material Science Research and AFM webinar series. Today's presentation is titled 3D Printing and Electronics. This month, we have run into a schedule conflict that has both Dr. Vinkula and myself out traveling as we speak, so we had to pre-record today's session in order to keep our regular schedule. The presentation is expected to take approximately 40 to 45 minutes, but we will not be able to hold our usual live question and answer session at the end. Please ask any questions that you have using the question module on the GoToWebinar dashboard. The system will save your questions in our event report, and Dr. Advincula will answer them in a follow-up email to today's attendees. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Rigoberto Advincula. Dr. Advincula is a professor of macromolecular science and engineering at Case Western Reserve University and the editor-in-chief of MRS Communications. He's a fellow of the American Chemical Society and is the author of more than 250 peer-reviewed publications. Please welcome Dr. Rigoberto Advincula. Thank you very much, Richard, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. And um, we have to say upfront that uh, we cannot have this on a live recorded uh, uh, session because of some schedule conflict, but we will be able and I will be able to get your questions and answer them um, once they are forwarded to me. So today's topic is on 3D printing, uh, printed electronics. I'm going to give you an overview of how 3D printing has the potential to change how manufacturing is done in 3D printing beyond prototyping and possibly towards scale up. So I'm with Case Western Research University uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, a major research university in a very cultural part northeast of Ohio where we are home to the uh, Cleveland Orchestra, Cleveland Museum of Art, and uh, in the city, we have access to some of these cultural gems uh, in our country. But we're also home to the Think Box, one of the first 3D printing makerspace institutes in a major university uh, where the access is actually free. Uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, some endowed uh, programs that allow the students and outsiders to use it. So at the Macromolecular Science Engineering Department, I'm one of the professors there. I'm located at the fifth floor, and uh, if you have an opportunity to visit, please do so. I'm also editor of the MRS Communications, uh, editor-in-chief, and I welcome your best contributions as research letter and in Brighted prospective articles. So back in 2016, I gave this talk at the World Economic Forum, where uh, I discussed the possibilities of using 3D printing uh, from outer space to inner space to uh, advanced manufacturing, robotics, tissue engineering. And so this series really has been geared towards explaining the possibilities of 3D printing, an additive manufacturing process that can supplant perhaps formative and subtracting manufacturing in the future. Uh, in fact, one can purchase uh, their own 3D printer and uh, you can have high volume, high throughput printers with various uh, starting materials from polymers to metals to ceramics, all accessible these days uh, because of the uh, interest in advanced and additive manufacturing. In fact, 20 years ago, my first uh, encounter with 3D printing was a two photon polymerization, high resolution stereolithographic printing. Uh, in this case, you can see how res high resolution is achieved in the uh, micron scale, all because the optics as well as the photochemical and the photonic approaches enable a very efficient use of uh, what we call two photon resonance in this type of uh, printing using, in fact, almost the same resin that we use today in a technique called SLA or stereo lithographic apparatus. Uh, actually, there's a lot of interest in robotics. Uh, 3D printing and soft robotics means that in the future, uh, gears, arms, other mechanical parts in a traditional robotic machine will be replaced by 3D printed parts. And there's a lot of interest in soft robotics where you have stimuli response leading to the combination of actuators and sensors uh, with 3D printed objects that work in different media. Uh, I like this um, 
example of the possibility from 2D to 3D to 4D in that you can program various types of assemblies and uh, um, origami-like type of architectures so that uh, in a two-dimensional to three-dimensional uh, design, one can incorporate the three-dimensional architecture after the fact or after the object has been printed. And this could be from um, metals to polymers or even programmable soft materials. In other words, there's a room, there's lots of room really for applying intelligence, artificial intelligence and machine, machine learning together with 3D printing. So here you can see the advantage of 3D printing in that it provides for complexity uh, and the difference between formative manufacturing is that uh, you are able to include high performance or different types of stimuli response with complex geometries in a limited production basis. Uh, in a way, additive manufacturing uh, really complements uh, formative and subtractive manufacturing uh, in that you can incorporate multi-materials and different architectures in a, a 3D uh, or a digital design uh, together with CNC type of movement. Uh, CNC type of movement is actually what they use for subtractive manufacturing or machining, which is a mature type of manufacturing method widely used in the metal industries as well as plastics. Uh, here you have a summary, and it's important for me to show this to you, of the various uh, 3D printing methods out there. There's about 10 here that I can name because part of our discussion with 3D printing electronics today is a review of the possibility of applying SLA, um, FDM, SLS, um, and other um, binder jet and other types of traditional uh, or, or getting to be traditional additive manufacturing methods into 3D printed electronics. And so you have a lot of possible applications uh, from aerospace to marine. And of course, electronics means one can look at PCB boards, transistors, micro optics displays, interconnects, and other types of high value, high end uh, electronic manufacturing. So let's review and let's. Uh, I go back to the basic of what it means to have electronic devices or in particular the possibility of printed electronics via 3D printing. Uh, so when we talk about electronics, we can be looking at the uh, motherboards, the integrated circuits, chips, microprocessors, or we are talking about RFIDs and other printed electronics uh, flexible electronics that are being uh, manufactured today. In a way, an integrated um, box such as your desktop computer, your notebook computer, or other types of displays and devices, audio devices, uh, have a lot of parts, but the um, brain or, or the uh, uh, motherboard controls a lot of the device function. Uh, and there you will integrate, of course, uh, uh, resistors, capacitors, uh, electronic storage or energy storage or batteries, sensors, and even various electromechanical and uh, mechanical parts. Um, these days, there's a lot of interest on flexible devices. Flexible and printed electronics are be becoming synonymous because a lot of these layered systems actually combine both passive and active elements, let's say on a flexible plastic substrate, uh, which makes them more conformal and lightweight and has a lot of high functionality. So a lot of this flexible electronics, of course, uh, we can classify as 2D has their origin in the 3D. So most of what we still have today in terms of gadgets, appliances, uh, different types of uh, uh, electrical and electromechanical devices rely on the common PCB or printed circuit board, which we can say uh, or call a three-dimensional architecture uh, that uh, involves soldering 
And a PCB board, uh, uh, typical of that of a thermoset or an epoxy or other polymers, where you have placement and patterning of different uh, metals and dielectrics as well as interconnects to make up your circuit board. And a lot of this can be classified basically uh, as active or passive. In a way, uh, electricity or electronic devices really depend on the control of the flow of electrons. Now, uh, different printing methods are beginning to make their way in flexible electronic, but for large, uh, large uh, part, this is true whole uh, devices or surface mount technologies or SMTs. And the SMT means that one has to pick and place or to fabricate and solder these components, whether it's a resistor, capacitor, an LED device, or your microprocessor in a constructed circuit. So uh, a little more on the traditional manufacturing method. Uh, one can say that it all begins on a, a substrate or flat material surface, especially when we go to the microprocessor level. Uh, the microprocessor level technology really is a subtractive technology in that you have your substrate, you add your material, you then add what we call a photoresist. Typically, these are polymers that are capable of uh, converting into an acid or an etchable component by UV masking or photolithography. So by as masking a pattern, or photolithography on the, this resist material. This creates a pattern. Uh, in this case, etching allows us to remove uh, the photoresist material and end up with a pattern added material or even a metal. Now, what we want to achieve in an additive technology is to really do away with this wasteful uh, process uh, in the sense that it uses a lot of water, washing, cleaning, drying into a more additive process that may simply involve printing, embossing, or other non-lithographic patterning methods on a substrate. Now, a very common term, of course, is VLSI manufacturing or very large scale integration. So it's very similar to the uh, um, Manufact traditional manufacturing uh, we just covered, which is subtractive. So again, starts with the wafer. You deposit your um, substrate. Uh, then you apply a uh, lithographic mask, which then creates a pattern. And then after stripping um, or etching the photoresist mask, then you can remove residues, uh, particles, clean it up, and then apply your metal. And then that creates essentially the pattern of the metal on your substrate. Now, uh, gaining traction, especially in flexible electronics, is the use of 2D printing technologies. When I apply, uh, when I use the term 2D printing, I'm referring, of course, to delivery of inks conductive inks or conductive metal uh, uh, solutions on substrate surfaces. Uh, this can be classified into two types, a continuous inkjet or a drop-on-demand inkjet. Sort of how you would uh, use uh, digital printing uh, today with inkjet technology, uh, the DOD or drop-on-demand inkjet can be further divided into piezo-driven thermally driven or electrostatic. Piezo driven means you have a piezo resistor that de delivers the droplet precisely or a thermally activated um, delivery based on a vapor bubble or an electrostatic deposition based on charge attraction. Uh, so all of these uh, variations are basically uh, what involves a printing head, which is a type of um, um, microelectronic mechanical system that allows very high resolution of printing. Uh, such type of printing, of course, is valuable in a higher resolution uh, printing for flexible electronics. Now, what I'm going to do right now is to give you an overview 
of the various 3D printing, printing technologies out there. Uh, in a way, what I want to synthesize in this uh, talk is to give you or uh, show you the possibilities that some of the 3D printing technologies we have today uh, can be used for de delivering the passive, active component of your uh, printed circuit. Uh, it could be used for uh, delivering the conducting ink, metal, or even creating the pattern that can be uh, later on used for uh, electroless deposition or the addition of a, another material based on a printed pattern or geometry. Uh, so forgive me for, uh, again, giving this overview on 3D printing methodologies for those of you who are familiar, but I want uh, to make sure that our other listeners who are not familiar with 3D printing gains this uh, appreciation of these various methods. Uh, so SLA, or stereolithographic apparatus, uh, uh, almost similar to DLP or digital light projection, makes use of a resin material that is um, photopolymerized, one photon efficiency, uh, such that the photo curing or cross-linking of the resin, whether it's using a digital projection or micro lens with a photo initiator sensitive to light, results really in quite a high resolution of printed material. And it's one of my favorite methods that allow us to look at formulations of the resin or photopolymerizable resin with various metal, conducting polymers, carbon nanotubes, or other nanomaterials uh, for fabrication. Now, uh, there are several variations of what we call laminated object manufacturing. Uh, which can involve foils or metal foils or polymer foils that are curable uh, with laser uh, heating or um, curing. Uh, a very familiar one called FFF or freeform fabrication, otherwise known as fuse deposition modeling, uh, is uh, one of the easiest ways to 3D print a polymer. Could be a passive polymer or conducting polymer simply by extrusion methods through a CNC movement heating element in a head. And as you uh, produce this uh, uh, part, of course, you are depositing the polymer material. Uh, SLS or selective laser sintering or sometimes known as uh, DMLS or essentially methods for polymer and metal powder 3D printing involves that of a sintering method of a CNC movement head based on a powder bed. Uh, the powder is replenished every after printing of a layer such that the end of the printing, you will have an object that's embedded on the powder originally and uh, be recovered after printing. Uh, in this polyjet printing technology, which is again, um, a platform that's popular and important, the inkjet heads deliver, deliver the uh, uh, various materials from uh, resin to curing resin to powders, and you have a support material. And what happens is there's a UV curing mechanism that uh, basically uh, produces a thermoset or, or cures uh, the combination of materials and a leveling uh, roller to make sure that an even amount of, let's say, the powder component, component is spread uh, with the fresh printing. Uh, almost similar is a powder bed based printing. The Again, the powder supply uh, leveling roller uh, allows you to give a uniform uh, uh, fresh layer. However, instead of a UV light or a UV curing mechanism, you deliver the uh, curing uh, component uh, with the print head. Uh, so again, uh, this combination of materials mean that the uh, active component could be part of the powder or it could be part of the resin material that is delivered by the print head or is cured by UV light. Uh, perhaps one of the easiest way to 3D print conductive paste or inks is basically to formulate your, your paste or 
or a viscous solution and then force them through a plunger or a syringe with a CNC movement head. Uh, and then the tixotropic behavior uh, together with uh, sufficient yield stress or shear thinning behavior uh, prints the material or extrudes it out of the material even at room temperature. Uh, so in this way you can actually 3D print uh, at room temperature uh, without the application of heat or even without the application of UV light. <coughs> uh, similar to this uh, with uh, the term ink or less viscous, uh, more uh, less viscous ink is direct write uh, technology, almost similar to your two-dimensional printing except that you build again the material because as you deposit it, a curing or a tixotropic behavior is achieved, building upon layer upon layer of the actuated or delivered ink. And uh, in this manner too, one can uh, deliver aerosol or uh, use of uh, aerogel, aerosol materials, basically spray jetting the material on top of another. And again, with sufficient yield stress and curing behavior, one can build your three-dimensional object. Uh, another one that is quite popular with metal, and I apologize if I'm not going to cover, in this case, more bulk uh, metal 3D deposition techniques, is that one can deliver uh, patterns uh, in foils of metal. Uh, basically, the foil is welded on top of another previously de deposited foil or metal base plate with the foil on top of it. And then ultrasonication or oscillation provides a very effective surface contact between the metals uh, resulting in additive layering of metals on a pattern. And like uh, FDM and other layering methods, uh, of course, this can be subject to defects or voids and ultrasonic oscillation uh, actually improves the fusion of the metals on top of metals. Uh, perhaps uh, one that uh, is closer to a three-dimensional system, the 3D Molded Interconnect Device or 3D MID allows one to create uh, first additively the object shape, uh, again, which could be based on a plastic or a metal or a passive or active device. So let's say one can employ uh, FDM or other uh, methods, SLS, etc. And then once uh, this can be done, uh, this can be either integrated with the addition of conductive parts during printing itself or other embedded electronic components. And then once, uh, uh, so the difference here is we are getting into the regime of multi-material additive manufacturing. In other words, uh, your, your print head or machine is capable of depositing both the active and passive component uh, for circuit design uh, or conductive path design during the um, uh, structure fabrication. So uh, once you have your embedded parts, then of course uh, you can employ SMT component uh, um, deposition or big plug in place uh, type of uh, connection, or even uh, the use of printing or printed electric uh, components as an inlay on the surface of the molded part. So this is approaching closer to what would be uh, maybe an alternative towards a PCB board or even three dimensionally designed uh, uh, devices based on the versatility of uh, putting an internal conductive path and an outside patterning or placing of your um, electronic components. Now let's start looking at some possibilities here for integ integrating the building process for the uh, 3D device. So perhaps one can start with a powder bed base printing, uh, which creates the uh, passive component, but at the same time, one can embed the electronic component. Uh, so you can either have uh, both the passive powder and active uh, embedded component uh, delivered 
uh, on the surface during printing, or one can use a uh, first pattern, uh, a powdered bed based printing passive component, and then bring this to another section of the printer or a design uh, 3D printing equipment, or actually place this on another printer and then uh, create your embedded electronic component. And you can also create the conductive path basically by another method uh, which allows you to deposit the metal or cure uh, the delivery of uh, a conductive ink on a pattern uh, on the uh, 3D pr uh, printed object. And then finally, one can connect the conductive paths to the electronic components. And you so you can create this internal structure built on a uh, essentially a three-dimensional device by a combination of um, both passive and active material and a series of steps that allows you to make this conductive path. So this is one concept by which an integrated device can be built by a combination of methods. Uh, another is that once you build your three-dimensional component, one can focus on the surface functionalization. Now, one possibility <coughs> is to use an aerosol, aerosol jet printing method uh, to create patterns on the surface or deliver a functional aerosol ink. And then the, uh, another method is to print 3D conductive patterns directly uh, with metals on surfaces. And then finally, the assembly and interconnection of other SMT device components on top of this uh, pattern. So you can have uh, uh, this, and then finally, uh, you can print other components that are accessible on the surface. So let me distinguish it with this previous one. The previous one, we were talking about printing, patterning, creation of conductive parts on the object itself internally. Here, we are talking now about functionalization of a, a 3D printed object surface. So one can envision or design the inside of the 3D printed object, and then finally use this 3D surface functionalization method uh, to complete the device. Now, uh, from here on, uh, I want to review some of the possible components that can come from current research or reported research that can go towards this um, um, interconnected system concepts that I just described. Uh, first, there's a lot of interest on uh, uh, devices such as decoders, sensors, um, uh, covalent printing on surfaces, uh, 3D printed passive electronics, uh, components for uh, batteries, uh, printed resistors, inductors, capacitors, and so on. Uh, so in principle, some of the native elements that can use metal or metal hybrid or conductive inks that can be incorporated in the current methods of 3D printing has actually been demonstrated. And let's uh, review some of these possibilities. Uh, first of all, uh, antennas. So antennas can be, of course, uh, produced using an RFID method and flat surfaces. And that's a current uh, commercial manufacturing uh, protocol. Uh, however, the possibility of 3D printing on a curvy linear object or conformal printing on, let's say, a 3D printing object uh, has been demonstrated. That means that uh, you can 3D print, uh, let's say, this antenna or have basically a molded object but then be able to deliver the conductive silver epoxy uh, in a, a, a surface printing process resulting in this um, antenna. Now, the design of antenna, of course, uh, has to do with geometry and surface, as well as the active component that is used. Means that it is possible to use various types of designs or 3D printed object designs and then on that object, deposit as a last step your uh, um, conductive ink or uh, develop your antenna as a last step in the production process. 
Uh, another is in flexible electronics. So flexible electronics means that you start with a substrate, a flexible substrate, typically this is plastic, and then one can then 3D print the pattern or conductive ink uh, on top of this uh, substrate. Uh, so for example, uh, gloves or other types of equating devices can have embedded strain sensors or electronic sensors uh, 3D printed on top of it or uh, even some of the elastomers, we've had uh, a lot of uh, opportunities to 3D print silicones and polyurethanes and other um, thermoplastic elastomers in our lab uh, using the 3D printing process. And then on top of those materials, one can envision uh, 3D printing your conductive materials or dielectrics. That means that there's a high possibility that in the future, uh, flexible and wearable electronics is better access with uh, 3D printing, okay? Uh, so uh, here you have several examples, uh, you know, a three layer strain and pressure sensor um, in, in the unstrained sta state and stretch state. And I'll give you an example of a recent publication we have with uh, this area. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, with uh, flexible electronics, one can use this for detecting motion or actuation, let's say with different hand gestures. So what I'm pointing here is it is possible today to replace um, traditionally formative molded objects, um, injection molded, thermoform, uh, blown film, uh, plastic materials with 3D printing. And the advantage to that is one does not have to go through the traditional tooling method in that you can come up with your design or prototype quite easily by 3D printing, and then add your electronics on top of that 3D printed object. Uh, another interest is on uh, soft robotics. Uh, so for example, uh, the um, active component uh, can be printed together with the soft component or soft matter component, another term we sometimes use for polymers, and this, can be integrated in a, let's say, um, this design, which actually shows what we call stimuli response uh, and sensing response as well. Uh, this octopus means that you have uh, actuation, you have movement based on light or a stimuli, and this can all be integrated in a uh, device by 3D printing. Another is one can look at various types of ink compositions, uh, whether it be nanocrystal inks or conducting polymer inks. Uh, the chemistry of ink is such a popular, if not um, a, a well-studied um, composition these days, that one can change the viscosity, uh, the resistance, or the stimuli response of those inks, and then finally 3D printed as well on the surface or embedded as a conductive path in a 3D printing process. Uh, here, uh, in a way, there's also a possibility of patterning, printing, and using, let's say, 3D printing to create areas by which you have a surface functionalization capable of hosting what we call an electroless deposition. So in an electroless metal deposition, uh, one can create or pattern the surface so that you have an attraction for the um, oxidized state of the metal. It could be a copper ion, nickel ion, uh, platinum or gold ion. And then once you deposit them on the surface, one can activate them or reduce them or metallize them as part of the pattern. Uh, in other words, in uh, electroless deposition, there is the possibility of using 3D printing uh, to create the pattern. And again, as a final step, uh, deposit a reduced metal on that pattern uh, using an electroless deposition method. When I say electroless, uh, this means that it does not involve the use of electrochemistry or rather electro uh, um, deposition or application of a current uh, to deposit the layer, but rather 
the methyl is reduced by chemical or photochemical methods without the application of a current or a bias voltage. Uh, in the development of batteries, uh, there could be interest on making interdigitated electrodes, uh, uh, let's say in a lithium uh, ion micro battery architecture, uh, one can first deposit the current collector, uh, which could be gold or other high conducting metal, and then one can deposit the lithium ion substrate followed by the membrane, LFP, uh, one can, without going to further uh, deep dive on lithium ion batteries or lithium super batteries, uh, one then needs to have uh, this enclosed in a packaging unit, and then finally access through the anode or the cathode, uh, where the lithium ion exchange or mobility facilitates its action uh, in energy storage. And this is just one example in that with the development of batteries or uh, energy storage device, uh, 3D printing can play an important role in making very efficient and lightweight batteries. Uh, so in summary, uh, what I have here are some possibilities uh, with uh, features that can go to 3D printed electronics. Uh, this uh, uh, some of this information are probably five years old even. Some of the manufacturers, and I can suggest that you Google them, uh, their current state of uh, uh, ability to make devices or uh, uh, tools or machines for 3D printing, and what is their current uh, configuration or materials usage. Uh, so uh, in fact, what I will do at this point is review some of these technologies, but better yet, uh, we actually wrote a review paper that was recently published. Now, uh, the printing system for 3D printed electronics, one can actually buy some of this uh, multi-material or multi-task uh, type of printing technologies. Uh, one in particular is by Bot Factory, another is by Nano Dimension Dragon, and some of the elements that I described here in terms of uh, pick and place or deposition of multi-materials or conductive inks uh, have been incorporated in some of these devices. But um, um, here you can see how printed electronics uh, can lead to mass production. You don't have to use 3D printing as a whole step in the production of, uh, uh, let's say, an electronic device. One can perhaps take baby steps, that is, you can incorporate uh, 3D printing on current manufacturing materials, either as a last step or as, as part of the uh, creation of the board or creation of your flexible device. Uh, here's one example that was demonstrated by Optimec uh, in that they uh, have placed the printed uh, aero uh, sol method of your circuit on a plastic tank. And uh, this was deposited um, basically by a 3D printing type of technique. Uh, one can look at other types of conformal um, surfaces. Uh, there's a lot of interest, let's say, on the additive manufacturing side being applied towards traditional uh, molded objects, let's say, in automotive manufacturing. So. One can envision producing the part by injection molding and then finishing the electronic part by additive manufacturing or 3D printing to come out with a um, electronic circuit or design on a molded or plastic injection molded object. So uh, important points and perspectives. One is that uh, we have reviewed conventional electronic design process uh, is of course the norm and it will still be a challenge to incorporate uh, 3D printing and vice versa. Uh, majority of this uh, original equipment manufacturers or OEMs are still not equipped uh, or allow access on modi and modification of their current manufacturing processes in, in a way uh, a lot of these companies are, of course, interested in recovering 
their investment on their traditional manufacturing method. Uh, another is that from the additive manufacturing side, the current 3D instruments uh, design tool are not yet designed or solely intended for electronics. In other words, what actually uh, what I have actually done for you today is demonstrated some of the possibilities uh, for looking at these additive manufacturing methods and then converting them more closely to uh, electronics. Uh, uh, in fact, there's a materials gap or opportunity to develop uh, the chemistry or conductive inks or curing methods or thermosets specifically for additive manufacturing in printed electronics. Uh, also, it's possible to get more companies to focus on uh, new 3D printers or new 3D printed electronic design tools, uh, not just for prototyping, but even for scalability or mass production. Uh, and then finally, uh, we envision the integrated integration of these materials or uh, uh, different um, methods for fabrication together with internet connectivity or internet of things so that one can realize their current possibilities uh, not only with flexible electronics, wearable electronics, but the replacement of our theory, uh, truly um, manufacturable uh, and current printed circuit boards. So as I mentioned, a lot of these things we recently summarized and wrote a review article. Uh, I posted here uh, the uh, reference to a uh, review article that we recently published in Progress in Additive Manufacturing. Uh, so, so those of you who have access uh, to this journal, of course, can download uh, the uh, journal and then you can find a lot of the things that I reviewed today as well. Uh, so I'll be closing with some of our recent work that may lead to uh, possible application in 3D printed electronics. Uh, our group has a lot of focus these days on 3D printing of polymer nanocomposite materials including thermoplastics, thermoplastic elastomers, thermoset elastomers, and thermosets and some of our recent publications are listed here. Uh, let me just demonstrate one or two uh, material systems. One is this polyurethane thermoplastic elastomer that we published two years ago. Uh, the thermoplastic uh, uh, TPU material uh, owes its properties because of the hard and soft segments afforded by the uh, um, isocyanate and polyol components. And in fact, there's a lot of interest for this in biomedical application. And uh, I dare to say, of course, wearable electronics. Uh, so what we have done, uh, and this was a paper uh, that was published last year, is we use TPU, a plastic, as a precursor for making foams. Uh, so foam uh, here was generated by making porogens. Uh, based on the nanoclay incorporated. And we use viscous solution printing to prepare this material. So we printed a viscous space with the right sheening piece, shear thinning viscosity, yield stress. Uh, I'm showing here that we can 3D print ketchup like this. Uh, we can 3D print cement like this, or we can 3D print chocolate like this. But in this case, we made a 3D printable thermoplastic polyurethane. And I'll show you uh, the electronic application of this. So once we've converted the uh, base into an extrudable printable material, we then 3D printed various shapes and sizes. In particular, we produced these grids that displayed uh, various openings. And then finally, we incorporated porosity through the nanoclay that was the part, part of the formulation and the removal of the nanoclay by hydrofluoric acid etching uh, to reveal actually a porous material that was present on these 3D printed objects. So uh, in this case, we actually made the object by 3D printing, we imbued the various thermomechanical properties. 
So what I mean is the 3D printing drives the opening size, but the procedure we use for making the foam allowed it to be uh, more elastomeric. So in this movie, you'll see the 3D printed object as we prepared it, no conversion to the elastomer, simply based on the geometry and the opening size. So it's a plastic. And then if we change the opening size, you can see that we can compress it somewhat. Again, uh, it still is a plastic, but you get a, a different mechanical property. However, by uh, converting it, uh, uh, removing the nano clay to produce a por porous substance, uh, this resulted in the formation of a highly compressible and elastic foam. And we can change the geometry and the composition to give get a different elasticity as shown here. Okay. Uh, so from here, why am I showing this and why is this a good example of an electronic? So actually we took this material, uh, it showed various compressibilities up to a thousand cycles. But interestingly, when we coat it with a conductive material such as a carbon nanotube. Uh, containing um, paint, we can actually use it as a switch, an LED switch in a printed circuit board. Uh, so by turning it on and off, on and off, the 3D printing allowed us to change the thermomechanical properties and made for it a very durable uh, switch for turning the LED. Uh, so with these two last examples, we recently published a, uh, a 3D printed electric motor. So this was done by using a nylon powder together with a uh, graphene um, composition that we made together with the Penser group. So what happened is basically a plastic that behaved as a motor, a DC mo uh, an AC motor uh, that we applied a high voltage though, but still is a moving motor uh, where we incorporated the conductive material together with the plastic. And then finally, uh, we recently published a conductive elastomeric uh, foam for strain and gas sensing. Uh, so the active ingredient was part of the formulation, uh, namely uh, graphene, and uh, we also added carbon black. And as you can see here uh, in this very busy slide, uh, we are able to control or detect the change in conductivity or resistivity as a function of uh, compression or release of compression or actuation. So in other words, uh, this material as reported has been used as a motion sensor uh, where we can distinguish between running, walking and standing or jumping and at the same time, this material also is a good gas sensor. So in this case, 3D printing allowed us to make the object and composition at the same time, but we embedded the electrical or resistance function on the material. So with that, I'd like to thank you, and I hope uh, to hear from you. Uh, you can again access the review material, and I hope this webinar has been useful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Advicula. Okay, so as uh, we talked at the top of the webinar, we had some unfortunate travel timing this week and uh, pre recorded this month's session. So if you have any questions for Dr. Advicula, please type them into the questions module as you're watching this now, and we will uh, send out a follow up email with any questions that we receive. I will still take the opportunity to ask my usual question. Uh, Doc, can you give us a brief preview of next month's webinar topic, Polymers in Medicine and Introduction? Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, that is an exciting topic. Um, but uh, what I will do, of course, is reach out to all types of listeners and viewers uh, in that this is uh, somewhat of a polymer 101 in that we will look at various polymers that has been applied to medicine, biomedical engineering, whether it's drug delivery, bioimplants, uh, uh, and, and so on. 
So I hope uh, that will be of interest to uh, our viewers who are interested in the various polymers used in medicine today. All right, thank you, doctor. Uh, please join us for that session on a Wednesday, June 19th, when we fully expect to be back to our usual live format. And thank you all for joining us for this session of Park Systems 2019 Material Science Research and AFM webinar series. You can find more information about Park Systems AFM at parksystems.com. And please direct any AFM questions you have to inquiry at parksystems.com. If you have any questions specific to this webinar series, or if you come up with another question about today's session, after we've signed off, please do not hesitate to reach out to me directly at richard at parksystems.com. Thanks again, and we will see you next month.